Certainly one of the most beloved stories of the New Testament is that of the prodigal son. It's a tale that it's inspired artistic works. It's inspired other parallel stories. Ironically, though, the title of the prodigal son is not a part of the scriptures. It doesn't say Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. Our tradition and our literary history has attached that story to the parable. And perhaps because of that title, we tend to fixate on the son who runs away and then comes home after regretting that he did so. But when we look at the story as a whole, I always like to ask the question, which son in the story is in fact the prodigal son? Who is the object of the story that Jesus is telling? One might say, well, Father, come on, where have you been? It's obviously the son who left and came back. But when you look at the beginning of the gospel reading today, Jesus is dealing with Pharisees and scribes who are complaining, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And it goes on to say, to them Jesus addressed this parable. Is this parable so much about the reconciling nature of the Father, the absolute forgiveness the Father gives to those who have strayed? Or is it about how other people react to that almost irrational response of the Father? Every now and again I will hear someone, no doubt from the 60s decade, who often ask me, why don't we ever hear a homily about the prodigal father? After all, look at how he reacted and ignored the other son. And in that, we actually hear the sentiments of the other son the one who stayed, objecting to how the father celebrated the return of the wayward son. And therein again lies perhaps another clue. It's supposed to provoke us. It's supposed to get us thinking along the lines, this is not how we would respond to someone who had strayed so far and in such a fashion. I, the way he said he squandered his inheritance with prostitutes, you can hear the contempt, the utter contempt that the other son has, especially since he had been the loyal son who had always remained. And in fact, unlike the story of the wayward son, the story of the loyal son does not have a happy ending. In fact, it has no ending at all. The story ends with the father pleading with that son to come in and celebrate the return of his wayward brother. We don't know how that story ends. For all we know, the father is still pleading with that son to come in. For all we know, that son packed up his things and left the next day because he could no longer tolerate the internal corruption of his father's house in tolerating such bad behavior, the bad behavior of his wayward brother. We really don't know how that story ends. Long parable of two sons and those to whom this parable was directed, who we see the parallel in the second son, there is no ending. Almost as if Jesus and the author of Luke's gospel are looking at all of us hearing this story and saying, how will we respond to the return of our wayward brothers and sisters? Do we desire the return of our wayward brothers and sisters? Or if they return, would we celebrate this kind of joy at their return? Or would we expect perhaps they'd be back, but they'd be more on the level of the servants? As the wayward son was about to ask, perhaps well rehearsed, but the father wouldn't let him get that far. Every now and again, I run into Catholics Sometimes they call themselves solid, maybe even traditional Catholics. And every now and again, they bemoan the focus of the preaching of the church nowadays. And they'll often tell me, Father, why aren't we hearing more about hell? We need to hear more homilies about hell. To which I mention them, we'll look through the Gospels and see how many times Jesus brings it up. He does, he does, he doesn't deny it, but it's mostly in passing. 
Because what's the focus of Christ's preaching? It's not on hell. It's on salvation. Hell is mentioned in passing, or Gehenna is mentioned in passing, in light of losing our salvation, which is the, fo the focus and thrust of the gospel message. And Jesus doesn't deny that there are those who will lose their salvation, but the main thrust of his preaching is salvation, seeking out the lost, the return of the wayward son, the celebration when the lost coin or the lost sheep have been found. There's not a fixation on those who lose their salvation, but rather a thrust to help all of us obtain salvation. And yet there are those for whom salvation just isn't enough. They have to know that there are those who will lose salvation. They have to know that there is a hell, even though they know there is. They have to know that there are those who will go there, and they have to know specific names of people who are there. It's not enough for them to have just simply gone to eternal salvation. And I have some people ask, is so-and-so in hell? Is this person in hell? Is that person in hell? And they really are insistent upon that. And in one case, I finally just told the person, look, if you're that desperate to know who's in hell, why don't you go there and find out? But our focus should not necessarily be on that, but rather our salvation. This Eucharist and the sacraments that help us to gain salvation that Christ has won for us, helping one another, especially while we are living, and praying for those who have died for their salvation, looking for the lost to bring them home so that they can be brought closer to salvation. There was a time about five or six years ago, a YouTube vlogger, who I won't name, for a time had it out with Bishop Robert Barron. Because in one of his talks, Robert Barron said, in Christianity, as a people of faith who preach the good news, we have a reasonable hope that all people will be saved. No guarantee, and obviously Jesus had told us that would not be the case, but as people who preach salvation, we have a reasonable hope that all people will be saved. But this video logger on YouTube took great umbrage at that. And in his debates, usually between videos, but not in person, with Bishop Robert Barron, insisted that's not the case, there is a hell, there are people there, and he was very, very insistent on that. But who was more in line with the gospel teaching? The insistence that there are those who will not be included, even though we know Jesus has told us that, or the drive that we have as Christian people, focusing on salvation, drawing people to salvation, preaching the good news of this word that is meant to lead all people to salvation with a reasonable hope that somehow, some way, all people will be saved. Even though we know that may not be the case, as Christ has told us, that shouldn't divert our own thrust to preach that gospel, to bring more people into the love of Christ, to seek out those who are lost, to wait with the Father for the lost to return, and to rejoice when they do. Because our thrust is not on those who are lost and the remaining lost and those who are left out, but in the celebration of the lost who have returned, in the satisfaction where we have reasonably been faithful to living that faith and have not left, while at the same time recognizing how we have fallen and returning to God in the sacrament of reconciliation so that our sins may be forgiven and we may be brought closer through that washing to salvation. And there is the thrust of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The Pharisees deeply resented and objected to Jesus associating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is calling on them to rejoice because they are with him, hearing his words, responding to his preaching, as he is bringing the tax collectors and sinners closer to the salvation of eternal life. So let us, as we hear this parable, truly reflect, which is the prodigal son in this story? Perhaps it's not one or the other. Perhaps it's both. 
Maybe our titling of this parable has just been lacking in one letter. This isn't the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the prodigal sons. One who left and came back when he realized what it meant to be away from the father. And the one who stayed out because of his deep resentment of the celebration of the return of one who had been lost. Let us continue to hear the, in our minds, the irrational love of our Heavenly Father, who waits diligently, steadfastly, for those who have gone astray. And let us be among those who go out and seek the lost so that we can bring them back to the Father who awaits. But even more so, let us join in the celebration. A celebration perhaps where when someone comes back from going astray, there's a great party in heaven and no one's thinking of us because they're celebrating the lost who has been found. Let us be among those who join in that celebration so that either way, we seek out the lost and ultimately celebrate their return so that all of us can have our focus centered on bringing more and more people, not to alienation and eternal death, but to salvation and through the grace of Christ, eternal life.